Right, I've now got another very pleasur pleasurable uh, task, and that is uh, to introduce um, uh, this year's Sir John Burnett Memorial Lecture. And um, this year's lecturer, as you uh, will have seen, is Professor Yvonne Buckley from Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, Yvonne is an internationally renowned plant population ecologist and has made really important discoveries in predicting how plant populations respond to global change. She graduated from Oxford and then did her PhD at Imperial College. Uh, she then joined the faculty at, in the University of Queensland at Brisbane before joining the School of Natural Sciences uh, in Dublin. So please welcome uh, Yvonne, who's going to speak on data, what is it good for, insights from network ecology. Great, thanks Mike, and thanks to the NBN. Oh, I should stand here. Sorry, I'm a wanderer. I tend to roam the stage. I'll try and um, confine myself to one spot. Um, thanks to the NBN for this opportunity to talk to you about two of my favorite things data and team science. And to give this talk in front of people who love data as much as I do is a real pleasure. So here we go. I'm going to talk about team science or network science or network ecology. It's kind of got a lot of names at the moment. I'm going to talk about it in the context of three team science projects that I've been involved with over the last um, decade or so. The first is NutNet, the second is Plant PopNet, and the third will be Compadre. And they kind of give three different aspects of team science that I want to, to kind of talk about. So team science is where scientists get together in groups and we all go and collect data or digitize data and then we come back together again, analyze it together and write uh, scientific papers and also do outreach and, and engagement events together as well. So it's, um, it's not a new way of doing science. Like every good idea in ecology and evolution, Darwin got there before all of us. He was at the center of a network of um, professional scientists and uh, natural historians, so just regular people who just loved different aspects of natural history. And uh, there's a connection there with Trinity College Dublin, where I am now. Robert Ball, who was um, at the time uh, in the 1830s director of the Zoological Museum at Trinity College Dublin, wrote to Darwin, and this is all available in the Darwin correspondence online, which is a brilliant, um, a brilliant resource to have, actually. He wrote to Darwin and said, uh, if, asked Darwin if he wanted some of, the, some of Robert's um, barnacle collection. Now, at this point, uh, Darwin had been deep into the barnacle collecting and barnacle systematizing project that he spent several years on, and I think he was sick of the sight of barnacles. And he wrote back very politely, because everybody wrote incredibly politely back in those days, and said he had enough barnacles, and he'd probably seen them all before, and had absolutely no interest in Robert Ball's barnacle collection. Robert Ball sent them anyway. So <laughs> he didn't take no for an answer. And then Darren had to uh, write back very politely, saying, thank you very much for the barnacles I didn't want. That was awesome. <laughs> he was much more polite than I would have been. Anyway, so um, I'm just going to take you through some of these team science projects and talk to you about how, how we try and do it these days. So this is the Nutrient Network, or NutNet, and it was started up by a group of scientists in the US, um, and uh, Elizabeth Borer and Eric Seabloom have been kind of leading this off, um, and there have been several other scientists involved in setting up the NutNet. And currently there's about 100 uh, scientists or PIs involved with over 90 sites worldwide that you can see here on this map. And I've been involved in setting up sites in Australia and more recently in Ireland. Um, and it's been running now for over 10 years, which is fantastic. Now this model of team science is where the same experiment is done across a number of different sites. Uh, we're interested in diverse links or uh, causative pathways between species diversity, plant species diversity um, in particular, and biomass productivity in these sites. And the two experiments that are done, there's a nutrient addition experiment where nutrients are added to different plots, and there's a herbivore exclusion experiment where fences are put up to exclude large uh, grazing herbivores typically. So there's quite a bit of infrastructure and quite a bit of manipulation that goes on in these sites. But the beauty of it is that we have the same experiment going on at multiple uh, sites and we can start to talk about generality and ecological processes at that global scale in grasslands worldwide, which is really exciting. And some excellent papers have come out um, of this network. 
The second network is one of the newest I'm going to talk about, and it's one that I set up having been formed, uh, my, my ideas around this were formed through my interactions within Nutnet, and I set up a, a group of like-minded ecologists, population biologists, and demographers who like being face down in a field, counting things in quadrats. That's what we love to do. So we've compiled this global data set now of how climate, biotic interactions, and human management are affecting population performance of our focal plant species, Plantago lanceolata, or ribwort plantain, one of the most common plant species in the world. It occurs from the subtropics all the way through to the subarctic. And you can see those blue points in that map there come from GBIF. So those are just the occurrence data for Plantago lanceolata. The orange and red dots are where we have sites. And you can see from this graph here that those green dots there are our sites in environmental space. So we actually cover um, an awful lot of the environmental niche of Plantago lanceolata, which is really exciting. Down here we have Plantago lanceolata occurring in very different kinds of communities, from species rich to species poor communities. Um, we collect some additional data, we're doing some additional work around this as well, by looking at the population genomics of Plantago lanceolata at all of our sites and looking at how demographic or population level processes um, affect uh, population genomics and likewise how the, the genotypes in these areas influence the performance of the populations. And then we bring these into a common environment. So here are populations from several, uh, well I think 20 different sites, something like that, all in common environmental conditions. We can experiment on them in common environments and look at source effects and local adaptation and things like that. So um, this is still in training. We've been running for about three years now and we're just starting to get underway. And of course, all of this is based on the team of scientists that sit behind it. So in Plant PopNet, we have 43 site coordinators. Some of them are shown here, all these lovely people. And the things, <coughs> some of them are doing things in the field, and others have got lasers in background or exciting things like that. But typically, this is what we do. Um, that's me on an island off the west coast of um, Ireland. And this is our favorite position to be in. This is what demographers do. So, and the third project I'm going to talk about is Compadre, the plant matrix database. And this is another team science project, and it's a different one again. This is where we collect uh, data from the literature um, on population models that have been published since about the 1950s. And this is where growth, survival, and reproduction parameters are recorded in the field for lots of different species, over a thousand species of plants now in the Compadre plant matrix database. And we've made these data open and online and freely available to anyone. They were already in the scientific literature, we've just um, compiled them um, into a format in which they're much read more readily uh, used. And of course, uh, there are predecessors of this project, Jonathan Silvertown and Miguel Franco were working on a predecessor of this um, quite a long time ago now, and we've basically taken it, and uh, Rob Salguero Gomez is the, the lead um, on that, and he, he does a great job of, of getting a large group of people together and contributing to this digitization process. So what's team science good for? As an ecologist, I'm very excited about our ability to say something general in ecology, um, asking questions at a global scale in lots of different kinds of environments and asking whether the same processes operate everywhere or, like in ecology, context matters, where does the, the local context kind of um, override the more general patterns that we, that we might see. So I'm really interested in that, that aspect of it. However, there's a whole load of other huge benefits that we don't talk about much in team science, but which might be equally important and long-lasting. We can assemble unprecedented data sets. These are data sets which haven't existed in the past and would not be possible without all of these people working together. So once we, um, well, now the, the Plantago lanceolata data set is definitely the largest plant population dynamics database on the planet, and, and that enables us to answer questions that haven't been um, asked before. We establish these new scientific networks. So some of the people that we put together into these networks are already friends of ours. Um, um, I started the Plant PopNet out by basically thinking about, do I have 30 friends around the world that I could you know, twist their arms into, into doing a bit of demography on the side? And luckily, I did have around 30 friends I could kind of you know, persuade to do this. And now I have a lot more. I have 43 friends now, which is great. Because <laughs> they ask their friends, and their friends ask their friends. So we, we're, getting, you know, we, we're establishing these new scientific networks. And that enables us to share skills, and share stories, and, and share um, scientific ideas. We provide a lot of training for early career scientists. So students get taken out into the field to, to um, actively collect data and get trained in basic ecological techniques on all of these NutNet, PlantPopNet, and Compadre projects. 
they get trained in field ecology, they get trained in how to communicate and, and interact in these networks of scientists. They get trained how to analyze these big data sets and how to curate and digitize data. So I think there's huge training benefits there. And they also get to interact with senior scientists and create their own scientific networks, which are of immense benefit to them going forward. I think that another aspect which isn't really talked about, which is hugely important to me personally, is the sustainability of these networks. And by sustainability, I mean a few things. I mean environmental sustainability. There's no one person here who's flying around the world collecting data and using air miles to do that. It's all being done in everyone's backyards. So it's quite sustainable from an environmental point of view. It's quite sustainable from a, um, if you think about being able to collate a long-term data set and keeping this going for a long, a long time. We tell people it takes two to four days a year to join our network. People typically do this in their own time at the weekend. They get their mums and their dads and their cousins and their kids to come along and help. So we have this shadow network behind the real network. Um, and it's sustainable in that sense that if any one site drops out, it doesn't um, negatively affect the whole network in a particularly bad way. So we have this robust structure. We engage a, a diverse knowledge set, a diverse skill set, and a diverse opinion set in all the different kinds of people who are involved in the network. And we reach a, through the writing process, which is very open and very um, contributory, we reach a consensus of interpretation and conclusion on the data. So we're getting the scientific, um, the great minds that are involved in these networks together, and they argue and they come to a consensus about what these data actually mean. If they can't agree, then they can always write another paper that interprets the data differently. We're quite open about sharing the data within the networks. So I think it really promotes um, good science, solid science, robust science, which has good acceptance within the community. So now into some of the science. So these are three of the NutNet sites that I've been involved in setting up, and they represent a continuum from this site in Australia, which is almost 100% non-native species, to this site in Australia, which is about um, um, some, some very dominant native species, African lovegrass here, but also some beautiful, non, uh, some beautiful native species in, around, in and around the non-native tussocks. To my site in Ireland here, which is um, by far the most beautiful site I've ever worked at, it has over 30 species of plants per uh, one meter squared uh, quadrat in some of our plots, um, and they're all native. So we have this beautiful, um, highly diverse site, one of the most diverse sites in the, in the nutrient network. So I'd recommend you all come to the Burren in, in the west of Ireland. It's, it's beautiful. I'll be taking commissions from the tourist board. OK, so what can we find out by looking at NutNet? Well, one of the questions I'm really interested in is differences between native and non-native species. Whether knowing whether something is non-native tells us anything about its ecology. So if we look here, um, these are data from um, a lot of nut, uh, 64 uh, NutNet sites in 13 countries where we have non-native species in red and native species in black. And you can see that the most abundant native species are nowhere near as dominant in a plot as the most abundant non-native species. So non-native species in general are found at much higher abundance than native species. And that goes right the ways down uh, this rank abundance curve. So your non-native species will always be more abundant, well, it has a, a much higher chance of being abundant than at any na uh, native species in your sample. These aren't just the invasive problematic species, these are just any non-native species. So just knowing that label, just knowing that a species is non-native, uh, can give you some information about how likely it is to be dominant within a, a grassland plot. So I think that's really, really interesting. Now, why, it, why are they more dominant? Is it because they're doing something new and different in the non-native range? Are they released from enemies and that's why they're able to get a higher abundance? Or are they just doing the same thing that they would be doing at home, but we just tend to transport the most dominant species or the most dominant species tend to establish when we bring them in? So this is some work by Jennifer Fern when she was a postdoc with me in Australia. And basically she found that abundance in the native range at home, again using the NutNet data, predicts the abundance in the non-native range. So if you're abundant at home, you'll be abundant away. If you're rare at home, you'll be rare away. So they're doing the same thing in their non-native range that they're doing in their native range. This is good because it means if we know the ecology at home, we can predict what, what it's going to do when you take it away. Um, there are exceptions to this rule. There's variation about that. We can all think of exceptions of species which are rare in their native range but become hyperabundant in the non-native range. But the important thing to think about there is that those are exceptions. For the most part, plant species and grasses <coughs> tend to behave the same at home as away. So non-natives are more abundant, but they're equally abundant in their native range. 
That leads me to conclude that the differences we see between natives and non-natives in the nutnet grassland plots is because our non-natives really are a biased sample of the native species pool. We're not transporting around the world random collections of species. We specifically go out there probably and choose the most dominant uh, species. And that's because one of the major um, reasons why grassland species get introduced is for pasture improvement. People choose um, uh, grass species and forb species which are going to establish well and become abundant in the non-native range. And at the same time, we're creating the conditions that are suitable for these species to do well. So we're fertilizing grasslands. What happens when you fertilize a grassland? We know, we've known for a very long time from experiments like the park grass experiment and others that when you fertilize grasslands, you lose species. What we see from the nutnet data is that when you fertilize grasslands, you're losing native species. You are not losing non-native species. So again, there's a real difference in the way that natives and non-natives respond to this very common perturbation of our grasslands. And we see that reflected in cover data as well. So when you fertilize grasslands, non-native species cover increases, native species cover declines. So uh, we're getting very clear signals here that there's a real difference in the ecology of natives and non-natives. OK, so I'm going to flip on now to the plant PopNet data set. So we haven't yet published any results from here, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a taster of what we've been doing. And um, this is some work by Jesus Villeras, a postdoc in my lab, lab currently. And he's been looking at plant traits, things like uh, biomass. So this is just uh, the dry biomass of Plantago lanceolata from um, a, um, lots of different sites. Um, I think, I uh, can't remember exactly how many he's got in here. This, these are the... Uh, yeah, these are the, the observational data, so there's about 40 sites in here where he's looked at biomass, and again, we're interested in native versus non-native range, and we find differences between the native and the non-native range in Plantago biomass. It's much larger in the native range than it is in the non-native range. That's what that means. And then here we also find effects of vegetation cover, so that's just um, um, in, in, very, um, uh, in very highly... Uh, um, Vegetative plots, we're finding larger plantago plants because they have to compete for light. And in, mown, um, in unmown plots, we're finding much larger plantago biomass as well. So we can look across all of our sites and see what's driving variation in the morphological characteristics or traits of plantago. So we can look at a number of different traits. Here we have biomass, specific leaf area, flowering probability, and seed production. And we can look at the relative influence of different kinds of drivers. So we see the native and non-native range affecting Plantago biomass and flowering probability. We can see climate here affecting specific leaf area and seed production. Vegetation cover is affecting flowering probability and biomass. And mowing, which is an anthropogenic impact, uh, we go in and we mow sites, mowing actually affects biomass and seed production. So we're start, starting to build up a picture of what is affecting how this um, plant looks and operates um, around the world uh, with, driven by these different kinds of drivers. Added to that, we also see um, climate having a, a strong effect at the moment on um, genetic structure. So the genetic dissimilarity, so how dissimilar two populations are, is driven by how different the, the, the um, uh, the mean temperature is between those two sites. So we see here that uh, in the native range we have this dark brown genotype which occurs in the non-native range in these sites and these sites here which are very warm and dry. Where you have um, more mesic conditions, so wetter conditions, we see this kind of uh, buff colored genotype doing quite well in here in New Zealand because the, the climate, the temperature is quite similar to uh, the UK and Ireland. So there, there are obviously um, signals of genotyping where, where something has been introduced from, but we're also seeing this um, uh, genetic dissimilarity being driven by uh, climate dissimilarity. So there could be some environmental filtering of genotypes going on here. So we, we're, we're doing more sampling, actually. Um, Annabelle was out in Greece last weekend. Life's tough if you're an ecologist. And collecting some more samples from the Mediterranean in order to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge here. So watch this space but it looks very much like there's a, there's a climate signal on um, uh, genetic dissimilarity. And now I'm coming on to compadre, and we're using compadre in a number of different ways, and um, the first way that I'm going to talk about is the quantification of life history strategies. So this is some work led by Rob Salguero Gomez, where we've used data on um, hundreds of different plant species in this database to quantify life history strategy. That means 
quantifying what the survival, growth, and reproduction characteristics of these different species are. And what we've found is that there are two main axes. There's a growth survival axis down here, and there's a reproductive um, effort and um, uh, frequency axis here on the Y. And we could put different species in different parts of this space. Now, this is important because life history strategy does determine how a species responds to disturbances, how it responds uh, to climate and things like that. So quantifying where species lie in this life history space is very important. We've been using the compadre data to try and predict whether uh, climate, geography, and phylogeny, how closely related species are, um, predicts population performance, some work by um, Sean Coots. And what he's found is that um, I'm just going to skip to the results slide here, that the predictive capacity of geographic distance decays rapidly within 20 kilometers. So if you have two populations of plants, even if they're not the same species, if they're within about 20 k's of each other, we, we can predict with some, um, some confidence what the population growth rate might be, for example. But once you go over 20 kilometers, or even 10 here for population growth rate, our predictive capacity declines rapidly. And this is very bad news. It means that we, we're, uh, given the data that we currently have, we, we we don't do a good job of predicting population performance. So instead of using um, just geographic distance, Anna Chergo, um, postdoc in my lab again, has been looking at how climate models, uh, species distribution models based on climate might be used to predict population performance. And again, using compadre data here, what she has shown is that, and here population growth rate is shown by the size of these circles. So these are, um, low population growth rate here in climatically unsuitable space in these light green squares and highly suitable climate and high population growth rates here. So this species, uh, Mimulus, appears to be doing what it should do in nice climates. It's, it's growing very fast. In poor climates, it's growing very slowly. But we find other species in the database that do all kinds of other things, like this Saponaria here, where it has high population growth rate even in climatically unsuitable space and Primula, which does all kinds of things in highly suitable climates. So that was kind of worrying, that climate suitability didn't seem to be predicting these integrated measures of population performance very well. There's no signal of climate suitability on population growth rate, the variation in population growth rate, or time to extinction. So that means that we can't use climate suitability at the moment to predict integrated population performance. However, when we look a bit more deeply, we find two interesting things. We find that instead of um, affecting population growth rate directly or extinction probability directly, what's happening is that in low suitability climates, shrinkage or retrogression is higher. And if you have high retrogression, that's associated with longer times to extinction. So this is a method by which some plant species will be able to resist these low suitability climates. And in contrast, there is a vulnerability pathway. So in low suitability climates, there's more vari variation in fecundity and progression and this higher variation is associated with shorter times to extinction, making those kinds of populations much more vulnerable to um, extinction. So both of these um, results may lead to management recommendations about how best to support the, the resistance strategy and how best to support those populations which are relatively vulnerable to climate change impacts. There may be some good news here is that in that you can get pockets of resistance even in low suitability climates, which is good news. Now we need to move on and try and identify where those suitable microclimates or microhabitats might be. So finally, just to wrap up, team science um, in all its different forms and guises enables coordinated and consistent data collection. And this is, if it's tied to interesting questions and hypotheses, can lead to useful and insightful generalizations. It's good for data collection and it has all of those other benefits that I talked about. And ultimately, building networks of data collectors leads to strong, long-term and sustainable projects. And I've seen lots of examples of that over the last day or two. Um, and that's where we're converging. <coughs> of course, it's nothing without the people that underlie these networks and underlie these teams. So the most important people to thank, other than those I've thanked all the way through, are the data collectors and curators and digitizers for NutNet, Compadre and Comadre, and PlantPopNet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne. That was a, a great talk. Thank you very much indeed. We do have um, a couple of minutes or so for uh, any questions. Do I see anything? Yes. Yes.
Yeah, the end, yeah. Uh, so the question, I'll just repeat the question uh, for the benefit um, of the room. Um, so the question was whether we're seeing similar results for Comadre, which is the animal matrix database. Uh, yes, we've been looking at Comadre and patterns of life history variation in Comadre over the last couple of years. And Kevin Healy, who's just moved to St. Andrews University, has been doing that with me. And uh, yeah, we're finding very interesting and um, so in some ways similar results. Um, uh, in that there are two, two major axes of variation. Again, they're slightly different to the plant axes of variation, but we seem to see um, a fast, slow um, survival growth trade-off, and then some aspects of reproduction and some aspects of the shape of the survival curve are on that second axis. So we're hoping to submit that sometime in the next month or two, so um, fingers crossed it'll be out um, sometime next year. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm sure that you will find different kinds of patterns depending on what groups you look at. I don't know of anyone looking at fungi right now. Does anyone else know of a... Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's various groups working in different places. I don't... Offhand, I don't know of any... There's a mountain invasives group as well, which is looking at particularly mountain invasions, uh, which might be less susceptible to the kinds of selection bias, possibly, but they tend to be kind of grasslandish environments as well. Um, I don't know if there's a forest, a worldwide forest invasions group. That would be really interesting. Yeah, it's a great question. Have you been able to prove from your results that this is the kind of research that can only be done by uh, dispersed teams? Um, so I did a quick back of the envelope calculation on the plant popnet data and it's 520 person hours of field collection I think or 520 no it's 520 person days of field collection if you had somebody working for two years and all they ever did was was be face down in a field collecting plant data they would probably be in a mental institution right now <laughs> it's tough it's tough to do um, long term so I think breaking it up and having people do it simultaneously but not do too much of it um, um, makes it feasible. Um, I can't prove that without, uh, without the experiment of, of making somebody collect demographic data for two years. <laughs> Any volunteers? <laughs> but um, it would take a lot longer to do it if it was one person um, and you wouldn't get it all being done within the same period of time I suspect and certainly would be beyond the bounds of a a regular scientific grant, I think, as well, which makes it harder to do consistently. Okay, well, thank you for those questions. Before we um, let uh, Yvonne go back to her seat, um, the NBN can um, uh, do something worthwhile as well, and that is give you a medal. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pleased to, to give Yvonne the Sir John Burnett Memorial uh, Lecture Medal. Thank you very much. Thank you.